Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And actually, I'm also with the Department of uh, Geog Geography and Environmental Sciences at uh, Carleton University. Um, in a couple days, I start teaching at Carleton. It'll be the first time I've been teaching there. It's um, another university in Ottawa. And uh, I'm teaching first year uh, physical geography. I have about 90 odd students in my class. I'll be advertising the course on social media, trying to get bump those numbers up to over, over 100 students. Um, it's basically on um, the um, geosystems, earth systems, you know, looking at all the different pieces. It's an introductory course. It's interesting, about a third of the students have some science background. You know, there's engineers, there's people studying science, um, both in honors and general general programs. There's uh, law students, there's a lot of um, art students, both honors and general, um, making up about two thirds of the course, I guess. So it'll be interesting. I can say I'm from both places now. Um, so this video is basically a walk through the snow late at night. Um, this is City Hall that you can see behind me with all of the Christmas lights and stuff. So what I really want to talk about in this uh, particular video is I want to elaborate on carbon dioxide removal, uh, which is step leg three of the three-legged bar stool. I also want to elaborate a little bit on solar radiation management to cool the Arctic. And one of the big ideas to do that is using marine cloud brightening and or the, I call it the anthropogenic Arctic volcano is another method, which is a lot easier, I think. Um, but maybe it's not as politically sound, but I think it's probably the easiest to implement. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about leg one of the bar stool, which is slashing fossil fuel emissions. So, Basically, if I don't wipe out in the snow here, find a path through. So, leg one of the bar stool, we have to slash fossil fuel emissions. This is a leg that is uh, reaching severe opposition due to uh, the US uh, political situation. But uh, the world, I think, is committed to getting off carbon. And uh, I don't think the U.S. is going to be able to stop that. You know, Trump says that he's a smart businessman. If he's a smart businessman, he'll recognize pretty quickly that going back to coal and staying on oil is about the dumbest thing you can do from an economic point of view. It just makes no business sense to be doing some of these things which have been talking points of the of the uh, Republican Party. So, you know, they're going to be money losing things. They're going to, it's going to uh, stunt the technology growth in the US. You know, if they went and got rid of all these scientists and stuff, they're putting themselves in Dark Ages 2.0. Uh, so, I really don't see that sort of happening. Who knows for sure, but you know, it would be a huge economic mistake. It would really devastate industry in the US. Instead of being leaders, like let's face it, renewable energies are at price parity, essentially, with fossil fuels. For the last uh, number of years, most developments in energy have been wind or solar, you know, a little bit of geothermal. But these things, the price points are so low, you know, stocks of solar companies and wind companies aren't doing so well because the price per watt has decreased so much, especially for solar, that, uh, you know, it's hard for these companies to, you know, have a price point where they're actually making money because another solar company comes along and offers cheaper price per watt 
and 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 these prices have been driven below the cost of fossil fuels you know subsidies aside i mean foss nothing gets more subsidies than fossil fuels like i think in canada alone it's about 3.3 billion just from canada to so like you know the trudeau policy of oh we're going to put a cap uh, tax on carbon and uh meanwhile you know they're paying uh, fossil fuel companies 3.3 billion a year. Like it's like having a can of gasoline in one hand and a can of water in the other hand. You know, and you have a fire going, you know, and the carbon tax is the water, putting the water on the fire. But meanwhile, you know, they've got a huge cylinder of gasoline that they're pouring on the fire at the same time. You know, and that effect is much larger than the effect of the water. So, you know, we live in a very strange world. There's a lot of crazy things happening, you know, and it's sort of dying gasps of the fossil fuel industry. You know, it really is. I mean, they're doing everything they can to try to revive their business model and, uh, you know, make America great again, you know, the Trump, you know, slogan. Well, people have weird memories, like, you know, what time is he talking about? When was America, you know, really so great? Like, there's always good things happening. There's always bad things happening. You know, our memories tend to forget about the bad things. Like, you know, think back to your childhood when you were growing up with your brothers and sisters, right? You know, if you have them, brothers and sisters. I mean, you might remember all of the fun things, you know, like Christmas, you know, going down, opening all the presents, all the excitement. You know, this is what you remember years later. You don't remember the big fight that you had, you know, that morning. You know, you don't remember not getting the present you wanted or something, being super angry or, you know, being pissed off at something or other. You remember, so our memories, you know, we have this, uh, we have this uh, kind of, the way the brain works, we tend to remember the good things. So making, you know, America has been pretty great with, Obama, except uh, climate change has been, you know, is still getting worse and worse and things aren't great for the world, of course, with that. So anyway, this is leg one. We have to, you know, we've reached price points where wind and solar are cheaper. Just it's cheaper to develop plants with wind and solar than with uh, fossil fuels. So let's just do it. You know, and countries that don't do it will be in uh, significant trouble economically. And I think, you know, if Trump is has got any business sense whatsoever, he's going to realize that pretty quickly. Now, I want to talk about carbon dioxide removal. So there's a lot of interesting ideas on that. Of course, we have to stop, you know, first and foremost, we have to stop cutting down um, rainforests. We have to stop... We have to protect our forests. Our forests are huge sinks. And because of rapid climate change, the water regimes, the hydrology is changing. The temperatures are warmer. There's a lot more pests and things that are affecting the forests. You know, forests aren't healthy. Boreal forests in Northern Canada are just not healthy. Those in Siberia, same thing. And these are huge carbon sinks. If you compare January 2nd of 2017, just a few days ago, to January 2nd, 2016, a year ago, CO2 levels are 4.53 parts per million higher. Now this is just a day-to-day -day comparison. You know, when the average of each year is compared, we're gonna have a rise of, I don't know what the number is yet, three and a half, 3.3, 3.4 part per million rise from on a year-to-year -year average basis. And uh, last year in 2015, the rise was 3.05. Meanwhile, it looks like, you know, fossil fuels from humans, you know, combustion, etc., has been flattening off. Well, this is bad news. We're, we're losing in terms of you know, it's still going up like crazy in the atmosphere. So we're losing our carbon sinks, the Earth's ability to store 
to capture and store carbon is declining. So we have an emergency situation, there's no question. You, know, you can look at any other parameter just about and uh, come to that conclusion. There's no other conclusion. So, you know, direct carbon capture is an important method. Um, so you have chemical chemicals, which you, you know, you have big fans, maybe drive air through these chemicals. These chemicals absorb CO2. Then you remove the CO2, try to recycle the material. So there's different companies, you know, there's many startups looking at that. Um, so carbon capture, there's also these carbon capture and storage plants that, um, you know, there was a report just a few days ago about an Indian company that is basically capturing carbon dioxide and making baking soda out of it. And they were claiming something like $30 a ton, which if that was the uh, case, hey, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. So if that was the case, uh, then that would be a tremendous breakthrough. You know, it's just one story. You know, it needs to be proven out. Is it scalable? Is it commercially uh, scalable to huge quantities? You know, things like that, they all have to be hashed out. Of course, there was a study in Iceland, um, a lot of geothermal power there, lots of holes in the ground, you know, running CO2 um, down into the, those holes, basically, you know, out, out of the other end and come much CO2 it was being stored in rocks and it was happening very quickly. So there's lots of things going on for CDR. We don't have a choice. We have to get the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere down to that 350 parts per million level. You know, they're 400 and climbing rapidly. And uh, if we don't, you know, the oceans are just gonna get too acidic. We're gonna lose the marine food chain and this is going to cause basically mass extinctions on the planet. You can't have life on the land if you don't have it in the oceans. And the oceans are, you know, because they're warming, they're becoming more stratified, less phytoplankton. You know, the whole cascading effects are quite negative. And the other thing we have to do is the solar radiation management. So, you know, one idea is marine cloud brightening. If you take salt crystals, run them through, run salt water through compressors, through nozzles, create all these little salt crystals, which can then rise up, you know, a kilometer, a kilometer and a half, and seed clouds. So there's clouds already there, there's water vapor in the air, and because these particles are the right size, the water vapor goes to them, and it brightens the clouds. So instead of having dark clouds that absorb solar radiation, you have very light clouds that reflect a lot of the solar radiation back to space, and that would cool. So if we generated these, if we did marine cloud brightening, Stephen Salter is the expert on that, um, one of them anyway, and if we did that process, we could brighten clouds and cool the Arctic. But, you know, the deployment and the costs are enormous. I think it's probably a lot cheaper, definitely a lot quicker to, uh, create this anthropogenic arctic volcano, use sulfur dioxide to uh, cause this brightening, this, these, these, uh, and that would reflect solar radiation and cool the arctic. So you'd have to basically, you know, seed the regions with this. And, uh, you know, the, another area that's very interesting is, you know, there's talk of, Antarctica is very cold. And if yes. dry ice is uh, frozen CO2, I think it's about, I'm trying to remember the number, 200 Kelvin, 210, which is about minus 60 degrees Celsius, minus 60 to minus 70 degrees Celsius. You know, Antarctica gets close to that. In fact, the record cold temperatures in, Antar in Antarctica are minus 89 degrees. So when the temperature is that cold, CO2 actually drops out of the air um, as dry ice. So, so if we had some compressors and uh, refrigeration units in Antarctic to bring that temperature, you know, in a station on top of the ice cap to really cold, perhaps that would be a good way of removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, that's another form of CDR. 
you know, another... Uh, so there's all these different technology ideas, and I think, I think what I'll have to do is some systematic studies of them. So uh, 